The following is a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society. What does it mean to be a forgiving person? And how does forgiveness work with unbelievers? Does God forgive them? Should we forgive them? How should we relate to unbelievers who offend us? Thank you, friend, for joining us today. This is Grace in Focus. We are the radio broadcast and podcast ministry of the Grace Evangelical Society. We are located in North Texas, and you can find out more about us by going to our website, faithalone.org. There you can read one or many of our hundreds of written articles, or you can find out about our regional conferences or our online seminary. Find us at faithalone.org. Now with today's question and answer discussion, here are Bob Wilkin and Ken Yates. I think this is an interesting question, and it's from E.S. E.S., okay. E.S., and it's about forgiveness, and I know we've talked about forgiveness, and this has been a hot topic in a lot of our conversations, even off the air, Uh, but his twist is, he doesn't say it, but it's, how does forgiveness work with unbelievers? And specifically, he works with somebody, and this person that he works with, this is his words, confronted me violently uh, because he was doing his job. Yes, was doing his job, and this guy confronted him violently. Now, he didn't say what he did, but later the guy apologized, said, I'm sorry for doing that in front of the boss. And then he says, Jesus teaches us not to take personal revenge. And he thought about how how should I treat this person? And he's obviously talking about forgiveness. And he brings up what happened after this. Later, this very same man did some stuff that cost the company a great deal of money. And ES's job is to monitor this. And he wonders, am I taking vengeance on him if I come down hard on him? Have I not really forgiven him? You know, I don't know. I can't remember. This is a long email. I can't remember if he uses that exact word, but that's what he's asking. And so here's his questions. Should I personally try to find a way to avoid firing this man? He has the power to say, hey, this guy needs to be fired, but he's worried. I'd say no. Yeah, but you can see where he's going. He's thinking. If it's not his decision, leave it up to whoever's decision it is, because it's not your job to decide his fate. Okay. And then he asked this question, would that be a way to exercise love, compassion, and mercy if he goes easy on the guy? You know, it- you're asking the wrong guy. Because <laughs> have you ever heard that there was a recent uh, situation I heard about where a young man who I think was 17 was found guilty of sexual assault or something like that with a 17-year-old. No, he was 17. I think she was 16 or something when they were in high school. And he he was found guilty of sexual assault or inappropriate contact something. And he was given a four-year prison sentence. And the judge ruled that he had spent like 100 days in jail before the trial, and that was enough. And so he was disregarding the mandatory minimum, which the state required of four years, and said, time served. Well, the judge ended up losing his job over it. And I'm sympathetic with the people who made the judge lose his job, because if the mandatory minimum is four years, then it's four years. Mm -hmm. And if a jury finds him guilty, he's guilty. And if the issue is he wasn't really guilty, okay, that's a different question. But the judge didn't say he wasn't guilty. The judge just thought... You know, these are two young people, and we don't want to ruin his life just because he touched some girl inappropriately or made some unwanted sexual contact. Um, Hello? Really? Right. I mean, I I don't get that. And I would feel the same way here. If this man did something that is worthy of being fired, then it's not loving to not fire him. Mm -hmm. It would be unloving not to fire him. Because he's done something that's worthy of firing, and he needs to reap the consequences. On the other hand, if he's not done something worthy of being fired, and you are in the position to fire him, and you end up and fire him, even though it really the wise thing to do. Oh, by the way, he says he says that guy he definitely is guilty to be fired. That's what he says. In okay, his email. then I would say the person should be fired because otherwise, how's he going to learn? It's like if you have children. 
your children are, are doing things that deserve spanking or deserve time out or deserve some sort of discipline, is it really the loving thing to do to not discipline them? Yeah, I think to me, when I read this email, I think what he's saying between the lines is, how does biblical forgiveness, how does that look with unbelievers? Okay, let me... I think that's what he's saying. I think his guilt here is, well, we're supposed to forgive. And this goes back to what we've discussed before. So many people in Christianity say, well, forgiving means you forgive and forget. It never happened. That's the confusion that's, right there. That's exactly right. And so, and it also means forgiveness means no consequences. Exactly. And that's what he's... Can't you forgive someone and still have consequences? Yes, that's my view. But I think that's what he's struggling with. What he's struggling... He even says, he goes, do I have ulterior motives? You know, I'm okay. dealing with this guy and... And I really haven't forgiven him for what he did to me when he reacted violently two months earlier. Okay, I'll give you an example I'm familiar with. Someone I knew was guilty of having an on... He was a pastor of of a large Bible church. He had an ongoing affair. The elders found out, and the elders fired him. And ultimately, the church had to pay a couple hundred thousand dollars because the person uh, sued the church... The female did. Uh, the female did because this was an employee at the church and he was over her. And so it was, that's a form of inappropriately using your superior position uh, to basically coerce or whatever. Sure. The elders forgave the man, but they fired him. Yeah, I agree. And uh, would it have been the godly thing to do to go, you know, we're going to forgive you and we're not going to fire you? Well, if they did, guess what would have happened at that church? I bet they would have lost half the membership because mm-hmm. they would have gone, wait a minute. How can you not exercise church discipline over a pastor who has an ongoing affair that wasn't just a one-time thing, but this went on over the course of a couple of years. Well, one of the issues here that... And by the way, I would say even if it was a one-time, that's enough to be fired. Sure. <laughs> uh, from that position, sure. Yeah. Did you know that the Grace Evangelical Society offers an MDiv degree through our online seminary? And tuition is free to those who maintain a 3.0 grade average. It is a three-year degree program, and you could submit your application now to gain acceptance. Then stay apprised of our registration periods for upcoming semester terms. Program and application details can be found at gesseminary.org. Have a look at our MDiv degree. Become an approved workman. Find out how. gesseminary.org. Now, one of the issues we haven't addressed yet is... Is there a difference between how I forgive a believer and how I forgive an unbeliever? Well, I don't get that. Explain it to me. Well, if we say that forgiveness is fellowship, okay? Okay. If I'm talking to somebody, if I'm talking about an unbeliever with whom I have no fellowship, I have no relationship with them. It's a total stranger. Yeah, or in this case, I don't know, they work in the same building, but what kind of relationship is... For example, when when Jesus says, if your brother sins against you and comes to you, is... Is that talking about spiritual brother or is that talking about a fellow Jew? A fellow Jew, yeah. Do we use different words where maybe with believers we forgive, but we treat the unbeliever who wrongs us with compassion and mercy? Maybe there's a, a different word. It's not a forgiveness where... Again, I don't. If it's a restored relationship, and I have no, let, let's say it's somebody I don't know. I work with them, but I don't know anything about them. But they do me wrong. Is it really right to say I forgive them if if forgiveness is restored fellowship, and I don't have any fellowship with them? Am I using the right word? In some sense, if you have no contact whatsoever with the person, it's probably even wrong to talk about forgiveness. For example, I ha- I know someone who their son was killed, right, and they forgave the murderer, and they visited the murderer in prison. They become good friends with the murderer. Well, before they forgave them, they had no fellowship with this person at all. But since then, they've developed some friendship. Is that forgiveness? Probably. Well, I mean, we we can take it even a step further. You hear Christians say, the young lady who was killed in Georgia by the illegal, you'll hear some people say, well, as Christians, we need to forgive him. 
I don't know that guy from Adam. Right. In other words, these these words mean nothing. I can't really forgive someone that I have no contact with whatsoever. Now, I mean, I can say, look, I wish him well. Right. I hope he comes to faith in Christ. I hope he's born again. I hope he repents, and I hope he gets his life in order. And so that is a loving, I don't want to be too pharisaical here about the words we use, but that description there is, I'm loving him. I'm compassionate to him. I want what is best for him. But I don't see how I can say I forgive him. Well, I wouldn't quite call that forgiveness because you're not in a position to forgive. And even here, he's not the boss of the company. Right. He's making a recommendation to the boss. Is he even the position to say, oh, we need to forgive this guy because I don't want to be too hard on him or I'm not forgiving him? There's all kinds of relationships we have that are not believer-believer relationships. Sure. Let's say I'm on a sports team and someone on the team offends me and they come to me and they say, I'm sorry. I think the same principle applies. If they say, I repent, I forgive them. If I'm at work and the person offends me and they come and they say, please, I'm sorry, forgive them. It doesn't mean there are no consequences. It doesn't mean you still trust them. It doesn't mean you still give them the same level of responsibility on the football team or on the office. But it does mean you forgive them. And I think there's lots of contexts like that where we have ongoing relationships. But I would agree with you. If we have zero relationship with someone, I don't see how we're forgiving them because we don't. Am I forgiving some government official if they make some decision I don't like? I would say no. I don't think I am because I don't have any relationship with them. I'm just disappointed with their decision. Right. It's just an interesting conversation about forgiveness. And you're writing a book on forgiveness. Catherine and I are going to write this one together. But this topic fascinates me. Me too. Uh, Forgiveness in salvation. What does it mean to have your sins forgiven? And also, how do we forgive others? And what does that mean? And what does that look like? Didn't Jesus say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us? Right. So it sounds like if we don't forgive others, God's not going to forgive us in a fellowship sense. Sure, sure. But it's not that we're forgiving everybody willy-nilly. We're forgiving people who come to us and say, I repent. Yeah, and as you said, that obviously doesn't mean there's no consequences. Because even when God forgives us, there are consequences. There are consequences. We forgive as he forgives us. Right. And when God has consequences like David. David. Read 2 Samuel. Right. First 11 chapters, David on the rise. Everything's going great. He commits adultery with Bathsheba, kills Uriah. Chapter 12, he's confronted. Chapters 12 to 24 is all David downhill. Yeah, even though he's forgiven. Even, even though, though he's forgiven. Right, right. And he doesn't die, but yet Absalom rebels against him. Absalom dies. All these calamities happen in the second half of 2 Samuel. Wow. So read the book. We love all you guys. We're glad you're with us. And until the next time, keep keep grace in focus. We would love to know where you are when you are listening to us. Please take a short minute to send us the call letters of this station and the city where you are listening and how many times a week you listen. Thank you. You will be helping us with our stewardship. Send it to radio at faithalone.org. That's radio at faithalone.org. We are so thankful for our financial partners who keep us on the air. Every gift is tax deductible and very much appreciated. If you'd like to find out how you can give, go to faithalone.org. On the next episode, we talk about John the Baptist. As a forerunner to Christ, how did he prepare people for the coming of the Messiah? Please join us, and until then, let's keep grace in focus. The proceeding has been a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society.